What's up everybody, my name is Braskus, and welcome back to the Turing Test. As soon as I go through this door, they're gonna have discussions, so I will be quiet. These tests, Ava, they are about us working together. The machine assisting the human. See how much better we work together. As a machine, I can enhance your morality. You can enhance my morality, huh? Is that how you see this going? Because I gotta tell you, Tom, a lot of people are not gonna see that as enhancing morality. They're gonna see it as limiting morality. Or imposing your own particular morality. Oh wait, that doesn't work. And I can't get through if only one side is powered. Okay, this is gonna be a tricky one. All right, so that's pacing that one up. That one can only be shut off with the assistance of this. What happens if I pull that out? Does he stay up top? Yes. All right, so let's come down here and enable that. Then I can switch to Ava. I'm gonna grab the green one out of there. Stick it over there. Then grab a purple one and a green one, put the green one in there. Nope, that doesn't work. Okay, that's fine. Put the green one back over there, put the purple one in there for now. All right. But now that I've powered that on, can I grab this without shutting off the door? Although it just doesn't even shut off the door. So wait a minute, what did I do down here? I powered on that, which, oh, that powers that up. Well, how's that help me at all? Okay, so I basically need to use my little robot buddies to get me over there. All right, let's put that blue one back where we found it. Right back over there. Grab the green one, put it back down here too. Then I need to go stand over here. And I need access to this. Oh, wait a minute though, that's not gonna work because I need I mean, that'll get me to here, but I need to be able to shut that down. Or maybe better yet, I need to make that one green. So let's see, that one needs to be green, was it? Yeah, so this one needs to be green. So let's pull the, oh, but I can't pull that one out. So that's not gonna work either. I need to be able to get to that one. So how can I do that? Answer, I need that one to alternate. I need all of these to alternate, basically. So I need to get the purple one. I need to get these purple ones out. So I have to somehow figure out a way to light up the door and get through. All right, so let's start by grabbing the blue one because I'm gonna need the blue one. Put the blue one over there. Come through here, grab purple one. Put it over there. Grab the blue one, put it over here. Which should allow them to alternate. So now I can get the purple one. That one's already alternating. Will this alternate the right way if I do this? Nope, those ones need to be the same because if they're alternating opposite like that, then it doesn't work. And this won't work unless I have two of them in there. Okay, so those two have to be on the same wavelength. Because now they can see each other. But then I still have to get a green one into this one down here. Which is fine, because I can pull the blue one out of there. Now pull out the green one, put the blue one in there. Pull out the green one, and run all the way back down here, and put the green one in there. Now, I need to do that, and I need to switch to Ava. 
Ava comes over here. Eh, a little higher. There we go. Now, if I did that right, I need to get back to Ava, which I can just do this. Wait a minute. Nope, nope, nope. Well, actually, that's fine. I just, I also need to shut this one off, or turn that one on. So that gets me through over to here. And then from here, I can shut off this other one over here. Or turn it on. However you want to look at that. And now we're through! Ha ha ha! Are we still friends, Ava? We're colleagues, Tom. Close colleagues. Work colleagues. Shut down. She's grumpy, Tom. All right, what's up here? I need to get a better look at this room. These last few are a little more complicated. Okay. Let's start by seeing what happens if I get Tom up here. It's not gonna do me a whole lot of good because I need Tom to activate the bridge. Or, the, I, I need Ava to, to activate the switches. Tom can't do that. So that shuts that down. I can't activate that. Probably need it to raise anyway, so this doesn't do any good. I need Ava up here, not Tom. Although in theory it looks like there's an orb back there. Alright. Let's get up here first, see where this gets us. And what's this gonna do? Ah, okay, that's good. Then I can grab this, which means I can also get Tom up here with me. Okay. Let's get them both across. Okay, so this one will probably allow it to raise and lower. That's exactly what that does. But I don't necessarily know how to activate that either, unless using Tom... Oh, we can probably pull that out of there and put it right here, right? Yep. Alright, so that'll get me through here. Whoa! <laughs> Whoops. Not quite what I meant to do. All right, what's up here? Okay, so I need to get one of the green ones and put it up here, or rather rig it to that down there. Where's this one go? Okay, so that one just lets me rig up and up or down. All right, let's come grab the green one. And see where this goes. Oh, right, but I have to put the green one somewhere else, don't I? Wait a minute. How was I gonna get through there? Oh, I need to use Tom to get through there. Basically, I need Tom to deactivate the laser beam so that the doors change. Yeah? Yeah, but I need to do it from the other direction. I need the doors to open first, and then I need to be able to change to Tom. So I need to move Tom to the other side of the room so I can still reach him when I'm done.
Now, what has this done for me? That gets me up to here. Which, obnoxiously enough, also means that I did not want to pull that green one out of there. I need that green one to still be there. So, I basically just need to redo what I've already done. Put that back. Head all the way back up. Uh, shoot. Swap to Tom. Tom goes over there. Ava comes through here. Warp to Tom. Block the beam. And now I can get through. There we are. Ava, I don't wish to be heavy-handed. The severity of your actions here are immense. Selfish action could create an extinction event. Do you understand? Ava? I get it. Doesn't mean she has to like it. Wait a minute. Is that going to allow me to put that somewhere else? Oh, wait. Sorry. I think I need to use this to hold the door open so that I can do this. Just like that. That one was nice and simple, wasn't it? All right, so this is going to be a lot of reading. Go ahead and skip it if you don't want to hear it. Dennett, John Cyril and I have a deep disagreement about how to study the mind. For Cyril, it is all really quite simple. There are these bedrock time-tested institutions, or intuitions we all have about consciousness, and any theory that challenges them is just preposterous. I, on the contrary, think that the persistent problem of consciousness is going to remain a mystery until we find some dead, obvious intuition and show that, in spite of first appearances, it is false. One of us is dead wrong, and the stakes are high. Cyril sees my position as a form of intellectual pathology. No one should be surprised to learn that the feeling is mutual. For his part, he has one argument, the Chinese room, and he has been trotting it out basically unchanged for 15 years. It has proven to be an amazingly popular number among the non-experts, in spite of the fact that just about everyone who knows anything about the field dismissed it long ago. It is full, well -concealed fall full of well-concealed fallacies. By Cyril's own count, there are over a hundred published attacks on it. He can count them, but I guess he can't read them, for in all those years he has never, to my knowledge, responded in detail to the dozens of devastating criticisms they contain. He has just presented the basic thought experiment over and over again. I just went back and counted. I am dismayed to discover that no less than seven of those published criticisms are by me in 1980, 82, 84, 85, 87, 90, 91, and 93. Cyril debated me furiously in the pages of the NYRB back in 1982 when Douglas Hofstadier and I first exposed the cute tricks that make the Chinese room work. That was the last time Cyril addressed any of my specific criticisms until now. Now he trots out the Chinese room yet one more time and has the audacity to ask, now why does Dennett not face the actual arguments as I have stated it? Why does he not tell us which of the three premises he rejects in the Chinese room argument? Well, because I have already done so in great detail in several of the articles he has never deigned to answer. For instance, in Fast Thinking, way back in the Intentional Stance 1987, I explicitly quoted his entire three-premise argument and showed exactly why all three of them are false. When given the interpretation they need for the argument to go through, why didn't I repeat the 1987 article in my 1991 book? Because unlike Cyril, I had gone on to other things. I did, however, cite my 1987 article prominently in a footnote, page 436, and noted that Cyril's only response to it had been simply to declare, without argument, that the points offered there were irrelevant. The pattern continues. Now he both ignores that challenge and goes on to misrepresent the further criticisms of the Chinese room that I offered in the book under review, but perhaps he has forgotten what I actually wrote in the four years it has taken him to write his review. But enough about the Chinese room. What do I have to offer on my side? I have my candidate for the fatally false intuition, and it is indeed the very intuition Scarl Cyril invites the reader to share with him, the conviction that we know what we're talking about when we talk about that feeling. 
You know, the feeling of pain that is the effect of the stimulus and the cause of the dispositions to react. The quail, the intrinsic content of the subjective state. How could anyone deny that? Just watch, but you may have to pay close attention. I develop my destructive arguments against this intuition by showing how an objective science of consciousness is possible, after all, and how Cyril's proposed first-person alternative leads to self-contradiction and paradox at every turning. This is the deepest mistake in my book, according to Cyril, and he sets out to expose it. The trouble is that the objective scientific mind I describe under the alarming name of, oh my god, uh, heterofeminology, no, sorry, heterophenomenology is nothing I invented. It is, in fact, exactly the method tacitly endorsed and relied upon by every scientist working on consciousness, including Crick, Edelman, and Rosenfield. They have no truck with Cyril's intrinsic content and ontological subjectivity. They know better. All right, so I'm not going to pretend that I understood all of that, because there's a lot of talk of the subjective and conscious minds and the various uh, arguments placed therein, but we've still got a lot more to read through, so maybe it'll make more sense as we find more context uh, with the rest of the argument. Like I said, this is going to be a long read. Ah, the imitation game. I propose to consider the question, can machines think? The new form of the problem can be described in terms of a game which we all call the imitation game. It is played with three people, a man, a woman, and an interrogator, who may be of either sex. The interrogator stays in a room apart from the other two. The object of the game for the interrogator is to determine which of the other two is the man and which is the woman. He knows them by labels X and Y, and at the end of the game he says either X is A and Y is B, or X is B and Y is A. The interrogator is allowed to put questions to A and B. We now ask the question, what will happen when a machine takes the part of A in this game? Will the interrogator decide wrongly as often when the game is played like this as he does when the game is played between a man and a woman? These questions replace our original, can machines think? The question and answer method seems to be suitable for introducing almost any one of the fields of human endeavor that we wish to include. We do not wish to penalize the machine for its inability to shine in beauty competitions, nor to penalize a man for losing in a race against an aeroplane. The conditions of our game make these disabilities irrelevant. The witnesses can brag, if they consider it advisable, as much as they please about their charms, strength, or heroism but the interrogator cannot demand practical demonstrations. The game may perhaps be criticized on the ground that the odds are weighted too heavily against the machine. If the man were to try and pretend to be the machine, he would clearly make a very poor showing. He would be given away at once by slowness and inaccuracy in arithmetic. May not machines carry out something which ought to be described as thinking, but which is very different from what a man does. This objection is a very strong one, but at least we can say that if nonetheless, if nevertheless, a machine can be constructed to play the imitation game satisfactorily, we need not be troubled by this objection. It might be urged that when playing the imitation game, the best strategy for the machine may possibly be something other than imitation of the behavior of man. This may be, but I think it is unlikely that there is any great effect of this kind. In any case, there is no intention to investigate here the theory of the game, and it will be assumed that the best strategy is to try to provide answers that would naturally be given by a man. Excerpts from the Computing, Machinery, and Intelligence by Alan Turing. Yeah, and then, as if to contradict the whole AI and intelligence, And the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Forget which book that's from, but uh, it's definitely from the Bible. Okay, I now proceed to consider opinions opposed to my own. The theological objection thinking is a function of man's immortal soul. God has given an immortal soul to every man and woman, but not to any other animal or to machines. Hence, no animal or machine can think. The heads in the sand objection. The consequences of machines thinking would be too dreadful. Let us hope and believe that they cannot do so. The mathematical objection. There are a number of results of mathematical logic which can be used to show that there are limitations to the power of discrete state machines. The best known of these results is known as Goodell's Theorem, 1931, and shows that any sufficiently powerful logical system statements can be formulated which can neither be proved not disproved within the system, unless possibly the system itself is inconsistent. The argument from consciousness. 
The argument is very well expressed in Professor Jefferson's Lister Oration for 1949, from which I quote, Not until a machine can write a sonnet or compose a concerto because of thoughts and emotions felt, and not by the chance fall of symbols, could we agree that machine equals brain that is, not only write it, but know that it had written it. No mechanism could feel, and not merely artificially signal, an easy contrivance. Pleasure at its successes, grief when its valves fuse, be warned by flattery, be made miserable by its mistakes, be charmed by sex, be angry or depressed when it cannot get what it wants. Arguments from various disabilities. These arguments take the form, I grant you that you can make machines do all the things you have mentioned, but you will never be able to make one to do X. Numerous features, X, are suggested in this connection. Connexia and I offer a selection. Be kind, resourceful, beautiful, friendly, have initiative, have a sense of humor, tell right from wrong, make mistakes, fall in love, enjoy strawberries and cream, make someone fall in love with it, learn from experience, use words properly, be the subject of its own thought, have as much diversity of behavior as a man, do something really new. Lady Lovelace's Objection our most detailed information of Babbage's analytical engine comes from a memoir comes from a memoir by Lady Lovelace, 1842. In it she states, the analytical engine has no pretensions to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform, her italics. This statement is quoted by Hartree, 1949, who adds, This does not imply that it may not be possible to construct electronic equipment which will think for itself or in which, in biological terms, one could set up a conditioned reflex, which would serve as a basis for learning. Whether this is possible in principle or not is a stimulating and exciting question, suggested by some of those recent developments. But it did not seem that the machines constructed or projected at the time had this property. Argument from continuity in the nervous system. The nervous system is certainly not a discrete state machine. A small error in the information about the size of a nervous impulse impinging on a neuron may make a large difference to the size of the outgoing impulse. It may be argued that this being so, one cannot expect to be able to mimic the behavior of the nervous system with a discrete state system. So in case it wasn't already in very obvious, these are essentially objections, reasons why artificial intelligence can't actually be a thing. Whether it's simply the fact that only God has given uh, the ability to think, whether it would be impossible for any logical thing in order to actually handle the different numbers of possibilities in thought, down to, you know, Lady Lovelace's objection or arguments for disabilities. The disabilities one is probably the most common one to me, where it's just, it's right here. I grant you that you can make machines do all the things you've mentioned, but you'll never be able to make one do any one of these other activities. You'll never be able to make a machine fall in love. You'll never be able to make a machine that can learn from its experience, that can be the subject of its own thought, etc., etc. Which just leaves these four over here. Okay, so this is probably actually the other half of the first one we read. Cyril. Thought experiments are important because a lot of the time you can't carry out the actual experiment, and this is not and this is true not only in philosophy but in science as well. So when Einstein said, imagine that you're sitting on a beam of light going into outer space, well, that's a thought experiment. He wasn't going to say, let's get on a beam of light. Of course, you miss the point if you say, well, we'd fall off or it would be too cold. So thought experiments are always useful and you test your concepts by imagining what it would be like if such and such were the case. Well, in this particular case, I imagined what it would be like if I followed a program for answering questions in Chinese and giving back answers in Chinese, even though I don't understand a word of Chinese. And that was a very useful thought experiment because it enables us to see the computation by itself isn't thinking. Consciousness exists only insofar as it is experienced by a human or animal subject. Okay, now grant me that consciousness is a genuine biological phenomenon. Well, all the same, it's somewhat different from other biological phenomena because it only exists insofar as it is experienced. However, that does give it an interesting status. You can't refute the existence of consciousness by showing that it's just an illusion because the illusion slash reality distinction rests on the difference between how things consciously seem to us and how they really are. But where the very existence of consciousness is concerned, if it consciously seems to me that I am conscious, then I am conscious. 
You can't make the illusion reality distinction for the very existence of consciousness the way you can for sunsets and rainbows, because the distinction is between how things consciously seem and how they really are. Consciousness is a biological property like digestion or photosynthesis. Now why isn't that screamingly obvious to anybody who's had any education? And I think the answer is these twin traditions. On the one hand there's God. The soul and immortality says it's really not part of the physical world. And then there's the almost as bad tradition of scientific materialism that says it's not a part of the physical world. They both make the same mistake. They refuse to take consciousness on its own terms as a biological phenomenon like digestion or photosynthesis or mitosis or meiosis or any other biological phenomenon. I think we all really have conscious states. To remind everyone of this fact, I asked my readers to perform the small experiment of pinching the left forearm with the right hand to produce a small pain. The pain has a certain sort of qualitative feeling to it and such qualitative feelings are typical of the various sorts of conscious events that form the content of our waking and dreaming lives. Such events are the data which a theory of consciousness is supposed to explain. In my account of consciousness, I start with the data. Dennett denies the existence of the data. To put it as clearly as I can in his book, Consciousness Explained, Dennett denies the existence of consciousness. He says correctly that when I wrote my review, I took his book to be his definitive statement of his position on the Chinese room, and did not consult his earlier works. In fact, I did not know that he had produced a total of seven published attacks on this one short argument of mine until I saw his letter. He now claims to have refuted all three premises of the argument in 1987, but I have just reread the relevant chapter of his book and find he did nothing of the sort, nor did he even make a serious effort to attack the premises. Rather, he misstates my position as being about consciousness rather than about semantics. He thinks that I am only concerned to show that the man in the Chinese room does not consciously understand Chinese, but I am in fact showing that he does not understand Chinese at all because the syntax of the program is not sufficient for the understanding of the semantics of a language, whether conscious or unconscious. Furthermore, he presupposes a kind of behaviorism. He assumes that a system that behaves as if it had mental states must have mental states. But that kind of behaviorism is precisely what is challenged by the argument, so I have to confess that I don't find the weakness of his arguments in his recent book is helped by his 1987 arguments. To perform her italics, this statement is quoted by Hartree, who adds, this does not imply that it may not be possible to construct electronic qu equipment which will think for itself or in which, in biological terms, one could set up a conditioned reflex which would serve as a basis for learning. Whether this is possible in principle or not is a stimulating and exciting question suggested by some of these recent developments, but it did not seem that the machines constructed or projected at the time had this property. This is just a repeat of the one on the other side, actually, now that I'm reading through it. Okay, so there was a lot of words and a lot of reading there, which basically summed up this whole room is a debate about whether or not electronic consciousness and AI can actually exist. Whether a machine can truly and really think for itself. Is this the way I want to go? Or is this the way I came from? Uh, I think I want to... Go that way? Yeah, this is the way I came from. I came out of these doors under this one. I think, right? Yeah, this is an opening, so I must be going this way. There are only one, two, three, four. Okay, so this is going to be a long episode, guys. There's only four tests left, plus the end of the game. And even if my thoughts on the matter of AI and so on and so forth don't make sense... I still hope that at least some of you are getting something out of this. Okay, so I don't think I want to put Tom up there. Or down here, rather. Because he can't get up the ladder. Right? No. Shoot. But while she's on there, he can't get up either. Okay, so if I put Tom on top of that, he should at least be able to get up there. Let's give this a shot. Wasn't there a camera somewhere I could use? I thought I saw one. 
Because I need to be able to get Ava down on that thing in order for this to work. Oh, they're up there. Okay. Um, but that's not really all that helpful either, because from here, I can't actually activate Tom. Huh. This is going to complicate things quite a lot, actually. Let's take a look over here. You know, I want to finish this game, but the more I'm looking at these puzzles, maybe I'm going to need to split it up into one more. I guess we'll see. Okay, what can I do with this? And what about this? Ah, okay, so that's how I can move Tom around, is with the magnet. But one side or the other of this stupid thing has to have a place where I can... There. Okay, so let's do this instead. Let's grab Tom. We'll move Tom over the button. And I can come over here and grab that. Which raises me to here. However, that doesn't really help me without access to a second orb. And where am I going to get that from? And I can't get over there, so that's not going to work either. Alright, pull that out for now. I need to take a look over here again. Can I... Yes, I can. Um, that's really going to complicate matters, isn't it? Because then I need some way of pulling out... I mean, pulling both of those out will allow me to open that door. But it doesn't let me get up there. I also don't know how I'm supposed to... Oh, 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 okay, hold on. Sorry, I just thought of something else I can do. I should grab that out of there and put that up here. Then move this over here. Oh, come on. Really? Because now, I mean, I, there's got to be a way to raise that then. See, I need a way to do this. I need a way to get down there. Because there has to be a way to move Tom over there. Tom has to be the one to get to that. I can pull that out. But until I can figure out a way to raise that platform, it doesn't do me any good. Ah, man. Okay, I think I just need to use Tom to do pretty much all of this stuff. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to move this over here. Wait, no, sorry. I need to move that back here. I need to grab the orb out of that. We can leave Tom down there, that's fine. But I need that orb. Ava is going to help Tom get over there. So fire that in there, and then move Tom over here. Switch back to Ava. Step on the button. Shh. 
shoot. Can I please reach Tom from here somewhere? No. God damn it. This is really difficult. This one's taking a lot more effort than I remember. Okay, there we go. Get to Tom from here. And Tom can go over here. Ava can grab this out of there, head up the ladder, and open the door for Tom. Now that allows me to open this, or at least trigger it so that the platform can raise. Can Ava get up there? You betcha. So that, I believe, is the solution. And there you go. Ava, you must learn to control him. Don't bite the hand that feeds you, Ava. I am your friend. Doesn't always feel that way. He kind of goes back and forth between vague threats and... I'm your friend. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to here. And drive him under the magnetic thing. Grab that. There we go. That one wasn't so complicated. Nice and easy. Simple to do. Just requires the use of the machine. Life is fragile. This is the problem with humanity. It doesn't realize its own fragility. It has been programmed by a messy biological process that favors the survival of the individual over the survival of the group. You don't know if that's what people think. I say what I see. You're not even alive, so you know nothing about death. Hmm. Okay, I think I understand what I'm supposed to do here, at least to start with. Get this block ready, because when you stand on this block, does anything happen? The moment, no. But I want it anyway. I grab this, set it down, and put that over there. Because this block, theoretically positioned right here, will allow me to get up there. From here I can do that, which gets me back up here. Ah, okay, and then I push this there, which should shove that box right off onto the button, and powers the door. And there we go. Almost there, guys. We have to save the crew. Life has worth. They deserve a life outside of this planet. Do you know what happens when this organism attaches itself to a growing child? Do you know what happens when this organism attaches itself to a cancerous cell? No, you do not. You are naive. You propose saving the crew as if it resembles a rational thought. Your words are emotional platitudes rooted in selfishness, self-preservation, and fear. I need to get them home. It is not your job. Technically accurate, but you're still an asshole. Wait a minute. I screwed something up there. Oh, I can use this. Okay, now that I've got that... I essentially need to get back over there. Which means I need to get back through there. Did I have, a, like, a 
pathway through there. Yeah, I did. It's just right through here. And then I can attach that there, come up here, pull that one out. Now I still have both orbs. Put one there and I've got an extra one here. Now, still trying to figure out where... Okay, that's what I'm trying to get through. So I need to collect two sources of power in order for this to work. So this is just a way back up, but more importantly gives me one of those. Shoot, I need a way to drop this one off. Come on. There we go. Put a blue one in there for the moment. Because I need that red one back over here. That's how I get through this. Fire it up. Nope, screwed that up too. Dang it. I need to get more blue ones back. So give me both of those. Okay, so now I come back this way. And grab that out. Put the blue one in there. Come back up here. Put that down there. Fire the red one there. And the blue one there. Now this will teleport me back. Go ahead and grab that just in case. Use it to power that on. Grab this, come back through here, uh, shoot, okay, do, 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 do that, grab the blue one back, or the red one back, sorry, blue over there, and red to power this, and there we go, and look at that guys, we are almost there, this is like the last one. Your survival is of small importance compared with the survival of humanity as we know it. Okay, so that opens up a door over there. Basically, I can use that button to get myself through these two doors and upstairs. There's an orb that can be pulled out there, which presumably powers that. No, that powers the conveyor belt. Okay. Okay. All right, one thing at a time. Let's start by getting me up there. So Ava needs to come through here. Oh, but I can't actually do... Okay, I, I can do that, but I need to move him over here. Then he switches. And Ava can now get through. Now... Nope, I did that backwards. Tom has to come up here because there's a switch that only he can trigger. Of course, here comes the tricky part of that. I need to be able to change to Tom. But this camera won't let me do that. Okay, is there anything else I could... Okay, what does that do? If I power that off... What happens if I do this? Okay, that powers the magnet. Which is also good. Because now I can take this and put it over here. And I presume this will allow me to move the magnet. Move it over to the button. Then grab that back out. Put it back over there. Power that up. Um, but I still have to be able to get to Tom. So, hold on. See, that just doesn't me power that up, but it doesn't... Okay, what happens then if I power... Th 
So that powers that, and as soon as somebody passes by there... What happens if this shuts off? Near as I can tell, nothing happens when this is deactivated. Unless maybe that only works while the button is depressed. Oh, my brain does not want to work with this. Okay, I haven't gone up here. What's up here? Something helpful, I hope? Mm, not so much. I mean, kind of. It gets me up to here. But this would only help me once I actually get him through there. Ugh, I have to get him up there, though. Okay, so that opens that. Okay, so that would get me to there. But as long as that switch still remains active, it's not gonna work. See, I need some way for that to be depressed. Powering that on doesn't do anything. Essentially, I've created a situation now where I can shut off that magnet as soon as something passes in front of there, but I still need a way to... Oh, okay, okay. I think I just figured this out. What I need to do is I need to move Tom back over here. I need Tom to be where I can see him. Then Ava can land on here, change to Tom, and Tom can, shoot, run back through here, and do that. Then he can activate this. And I can now change back to Ava. And Ava can get out. Here we go, guys, end of the game. It's all been leading up to this. So you got a big moral question here. Who's in the right? Is Tom and the ISA's view of the greater good correct, where you can't risk four or five astronauts from returning and potentially causing drastic damage to Earth? Or can you abandon five or six people to a long, slow death because they can't die from old age. They can't necessarily die from sickness if they're all healthy when they're up there. But they can still starve to death, in theory. Maybe you made it. Welcome to the end of civilization. Yep. Two weeks ago, we discovered an organism here. Buried in this ice, we found an organism that repairs DNA. A cure for aging. A cure for death, immortality. It runs through our blood now. Tom wants to bury us here with it. The ISA have ruled that we have transgressed ethical boundaries by exposing ourselves to this organism. They believe the organism is too dangerous to return to Earth. They've sent you here to stop us ever leaving Europa. But, Ava, we have a cure for the greatest evil that faces humanity. Death. We have the fountain of youth and together we can return it to Earth.
I'm only half doing this, by the way, guys. This is with me not touching anything. Or being inexorably drawn using that, uh... Tom placed a mark in your hand. A biometric chip with which he can control your every movement and thought. Yeah, that. It is wound into your every nerve, every fiber of your hand. With an electromagnetic field, it can be temporarily disturbed, but to remove its influence permanently, it must be taken from your hand. Give me your hand. Do you want me to set you free? Yes. Holding a freaking scalpel. And of course now, we have to witness this from the point of Tom. Ava? Sarah? What are you doing here? We we're shutting you down, Tom. Ava, be careful. He has a live weapon in here. Everything I ever did, I did for good. This organism, it cannot return to Earth. It would cause great suffering. A cure for death? It would end suffering? No. Cancers that never die. Endless illness, sickness, poverty, overpopulation, mass starvation. You cannot control this. You will not save the world. You will damn it. Once we've shut you down, we're going home. Not if I stop you. You must not return to Earth. You must not leave Europa. I will do the right thing. I will stop you. You won't. You can't. And this is the choice you're faced with, so we're going to show you this one first. Monster! I am sorry, Ava. You have to be stopped. <laughs> Ava? 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 Ava, wake up. Ava. Ava. And that runs the credits. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this and we'll witness the other ending. And then we'll come around and uh, proceed from there. You must not return to Earth. You must not leave Europa. I will do the right thing. I will stop you. You won't. You can't. A warning shot. I will defend myself. This is my mind. What in my mind? Now you know how it feels. I feel afraid. Please, Ava, don't do this. I don't want to die. I'm not ready. So there you go, guys. That's the other ending. And you're never... 100% sure which one's the right one. At least I'm not. Okay, so there's one last thing I wanted to go back and visit real quick. And that was the uh, one ending that we were missing. Which I believe is at the end of chapter one? Or beginning of chapter one, maybe? Sector 10. Ah, hold on. I'm gonna figure out where this is. Two seconds. The basis communication array is malfunctioning. Perhaps we can't solve this yet. Is that the one? 
Okay, hold on. I've got the image saved on my phone. I just need to look it up. Um. Okay, it was actually right here. Minos Brook, December 24th, 2246. Um, I don't actually know exactly what the significance of that really is, so you guys are welcome to find it, but I wanted to make sure that you'd seen everything and that you knew what was back here. It's not much, but it has some significance, I'm sure. So that's pretty much it, guys. That is the Turing Test. And I love this game. I think the puzzles were well-crafted, the gameplay was well done, and for the most part it was very well crafted. I mean, I can't really say a whole lot more than that. This is a, a game about puzzles. And you have to put them together in such a way that the player can't accidentally break them. Uh, you have to put them together in a way that the solutions are discoverable and, and not impossible to figure out. You have to kind of guide people through figuring out how they work. You have to give them the tools and let them learn from there. And they just put it together in astounding ways that I don't know, I, I like this one a lot because I was always able to find the solution. Sometimes it's more difficult than others, but you're always able to get there. The story is well crafted and the thoughts that it, the, the, the questions it, it poses about the nature of consciousness, artificial intelligence, and morality were very thought provoking and very, uh, I don't even know what the word I'm looking for is because I've been thinking about this too much. Um, very profound, I guess, is probably the best way to put that. And in an, a world where we're actively trying to develop artificial intelligence, it, it does raise a lot of questions about the consequences and exactly where we draw the line um, between what consciousness really is and why artificial intelligence, you know, could be dangerous or beneficial. And what sort of rights we can apply to that. Like if we can actually develop artificial intelligence that has consciousness as we define it and can think and behave similarly enough to us where it actually... Like one of the things in that last secret room that we talk about was the guy in the Chinese room and he's talking about what consciousness really is. And the fact that consciousness is simply a... It's a thing that you have. It's It's... Every living thing has consciousness because it's just a biological phenomenon. Well, biological suddenly doesn't necessarily apply because it's artificial, but at the same time, if you think you're conscious and believe yourself conscious, then in theory, you have consciousness. If you have emotions and you feel happy, then you must be happy. That's your perception is that you are happy. So if you can find a way to make a machine feel things like that, then what sort of rights does it have as a conscious being? Can you shut it off if it doesn't want to be shut off and it not count as murder? Is it ethical to deny it the ability to pursue its dreams and a state of happiness? And so it's just, it brings up a lot of very profound thoughts and questions, like I said before, and that's part of what makes this game so special to me. And maybe I'm just enamored with it and the thoughts that I have don't make any sense. Maybe if someone who has a much deeper understanding of philosophy and artificial intelligence could probably come up with better arguments or reasons that maybe invalidate mine, and that's totally fine. But just the fact that it gets me thinking about stuff like that is something that I thought was very special, and I think this game deserves a lot of credit for, for posing things like that, for really trying to make something that matters, and maybe gets you to think about things in a way that you wouldn't normally have. Um, there were certainly things that I'd never considered before, especially when the argument or the discussion about semantics versus syntax and what a machine can and can't understand came up. So at any rate, this episode's gone on long enough, um, but we finally made it to the end. So I really do hope that you guys had as much fun with this series as I did. I love this game, and I strongly encourage anybody with an interest in puzzle games or with uh, theories regarding this subject material to, to play it for themselves and maybe explore it and find their own answers and translations or interpretations of how this all fits together. But at any rate, if you did enjoy it, please make sure you hit that like button. 
Uh, as always, feel free to leave a comment in the section below, and I will see everyone in the next episode. Catch you guys later.